just turned 23 I heard the heavens crying above me The kingdom angel, I lost a friend I felt like dying again and again I went to hell instead of death But I keep fighting with each living breath I saw no way out from where I stood Felt like a fire above me for now yeah, you're gone We always give it one last try Yeah, you've watched me break a thousand times Now I'm all alone Cause you never show You say you will But then you don't That's how it goes Don't let it go I'm turning off my mind so I get by I just wanna be happy My best friend, 23, she left her body in Harvard above me. I saw no shadow, I looked around, searched every building and home that I found. I saw no shadow, but felt a glow, the warmth inside me kept me afloat. Felt like heaven, I found my bones, it gave me comfort when I feel alone. Now you're gone, I'm alone, yes it's Turn to get better Through the pain I will go Thank you.
you say why you're strange enough your eyes escape from mine when i sit you down don't you feel like we hold on the future is watching welcome to opcode virtual summit Hello, hello, and uh, welcome for the uh, last edition of uh, Virtual uh, Upcode Summit. So for those who have been watching from the beginning, uh, thanks for, for being uh, here with us. And if you're a new watcher, if you're watching the replay, uh, which I guess is quite common now, uh, and also one of the benefits of uh, doing uh, online events, uh, f thanks to you too. And uh, yeah, so like I was saying, this is the uh, last edition. So I just wanted to like stick with my goal of making uh, 10 episodes uh, at the beginning. Uh, so when we started, it was, well, I guess when, when, uh, when, when I started, uh, I think it was around uh, uh, March. Let me, let, me, let me check. So yeah, the first one was, yeah, at the end of March when the confinement was... Uh, uh, starting to get in place a bit uh, everywhere and from then uh yeah i've been uh, kept going so that's uh that's pretty good uh a lot of you have been uh, also joining uh our discord uh server and uh, you're more than welcome also to keep joining it so even though uh i probably won't do like lives in this format uh in the future uh, the Discord ster server is still going to be there. Uh, we're like, uh, uh, probably like 500 people now. Uh, actually, you can see here, this is almost 100 people online on the server itself. Um, so, yeah. So if you want to share information or learn, or if uh, you're a student or like uh, looking at starting into uh, hacking or software engineering or development, you're more than welcome to join the server and to ask people around uh a lot of uh, people were there like uh, more than happy to uh, do some mentoring uh, for people so it's always interesting uh whenever you want to get uh, into a new field to be able to ask new people so definitely do not hesitate to come and to ask uh, questions if you have any technical questions or even like uh, career questions 
there's uh, the spectrum of people on the uh, server is pretty wide from like uh, brand, brand new people to like uh, some people with like 20 years of experience in the industry even some people who branch in and out uh, from security um, so yeah um, I guess uh, <laughs> when we started actually I, I, actually I don't know if I can retrieve it maybe I can I can find it here uh, when we started when I started the first uh, one the first of course because actually like uh, we did do uh, a lot of episodes over the past uh, <laughs> over the past month since March so if you're not familiar with the conference opcode uh, initially it was a physical conference it was happening uh, once a year uh, in dubai uh, once we did an edition in in kenya and yeah since everything was moving uh, virtual i was like well uh, i guess uh, good you know uh, let's just like move uh, d digitally also and uh, yeah back when we started i don't know if i'm showing the website uh, here uh, Da, da, da. It's like a f f first version, iteration number one. So like, as you can see, <laughs> the, the quality uh, has evolved a lot uh, across all those iterations. I think back then, on the 23rd of March, like the number of uh, uh, co coronavirus cases was uh, less than 100,000 uh, confirmed cases worldwide. So now we're at 16 million. Um, it was quite uh, quite an interesting uh, metric uh, if you think about it because initially uh, when I started uh, this uh, virtual live stream, uh, well, definitely uh, I was definitely one of the the first uh, to to do one. Uh, the bug bounty people actually uh, were like quite early. Uh, I mean, uh, not not the like they were definitely like the first because they were doing like live stream like for like the previous years and they're doing like uh, very well they have a huge like uh, strong uh, community uh but yeah be before like people started to jump even more from going from a physical to like a virtual event uh so we're, we're definitely one of the first people to do it uh, before the uh the, the confinement um also like it does feel like there's so much content now online and virtual presentation is kind of like hard to end pick uh what you want to see so it's just like easier to watch like the, the replays after uh but yeah as you can see like we definitely had a lot of uh uh episodes i was hoping that we would reach like the 1000 uh subscribers uh by the time we reach uh, the uh 10th episode so you know that we didn't grow as exponentially as the coronavirus but uh uh, still you know uh, <laughs> um but yeah like we definitely did add a bunch of episodes like six one two three four five six, six so like uh, almost like 40 uh different talks that we have had over the past uh, months so that's pretty uh that's pretty cool and just for no, let me check uh, here uh yeah yeah there is a discord uh hi if you want to to join it um a lot of uh people there trying to get into uh the the uh, the industry uh should uh, definitely uh, come join it the link is here or you can just click here um it's pretty it's pretty good uh, a lot of people have been using um what's the name uh, slack a lot but it's not very uh community uh, friendly uh, another thing that I've been announcing on Twitter, uh, ta -da -da, uh, not here, is also that ta -da -da, I will be giving away a complimentary ticket for Black Hat Virtual Summit, which is happening uh, next week, I think 5 and 6 of August. Um, so. Yeah, if you just go on Twitter, on the Upcode Twitter, you should see uh, the rules. So you just need to subscribe to like the YouTube or Twitch channel, share the link on Twitter to say that you subscribe and like make sure to use the uh, hashtag. And then uh, probably uh, at the end, you know, I will be, um, I will be like uh, picking uh, a, a winner. Uh, and uh, yeah, so definitely if you want to uh 
uh, attend like uh, Black Hat next week. Uh, you know, if you cannot afford the tickets, that's uh, your uh, your opportunity. Uh, I know like traveling to Black Hat has been uh, even like before like the confinement has been complicated for a lot of people who are not living in the US. So it's definitely uh, a good opportunity for that. And um, and also, if I do not do uh, you know like more editions in this format, what would probably happen is that uh, instead you know I would probably just like uh, Twitch some stuff, uh, well stream some stuff on on Twitch. Uh, it's quite, I, I would say, it's more straightforward to uh, to stream things on on Twitch. Uh, Although I'm sure a lot of you uh, have a YouTube account, but not a Twitch account, uh, but it's a, it's a pretty good uh, platform. And um, and to be honest, like since the beginning of the uh, pandemic, like uh, a lot of um, interesting content has been moving to to Twitch. Uh, initially, I was just like focusing on YouTube because it's like okay, that's going to be the easiest thing for everyone. But there is more and more content uh, related to like software development or like uh, computer security. Oh, infosec cyber uh on twitch now so that's that's pretty cool uh and the crowd it's interesting it's completely like different it's a much much younger crowd uh it's like youtube is what facebook is and instagram like twitch to uh, is to like youtube what um uh, instagram is to facebook uh, so yeah so our agenda for today so we're gonna have uh one presentation from uh, Caleb and Kyle uh, from Microsoft who are going to be uh, discussing their experience uh, as w uh, from working in a, in a red team uh, at Microsoft. So there's some very interesting uh, lessons uh, in that presentation, especially if you're like get getting into uh, like, well, uh, red teaming or if you want to get into like uh, computer security, but you are not sure uh, that should be like very interesting. And the uh, second uh, presentation is going to be a panel uh, uh, moderated by Mark. So <laughs> when I was uh, every time I asked for like suggestion uh, for people, and uh, actually Mark uh, kindly uh, suggested that uh, we should do like a, a crypto um, ask me anything uh, type of uh, panel, and I said uh, sure, I think it's a great idea, and a lot of people would benefit uh, from it, especially like uh, uh, well. I mean, crypto, like over the past like 10 years, uh, became uh, more and more mainstream and everyone is uh, discussing about it. Uh, we have seen it with with Zoom, for instance, like uh, all the um, issues uh, <laughs> that it, it caused when people are kind of like doubting it. Um, but uh, yeah, so that should be also a quite interesting uh, panel. And uh, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to use the chat, ask your questions in the chat. I will uh, take the questions at the end of the presentation or if it's during the, 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 the panel, you know, either Mark or I uh, would read the, the questions. And um, yeah, so do not hesitate to engage and interact. And, uh, and remember, if you want to get the uh, ticket for Black Hat for next week, uh, just check on Twitter, here are the rules. So just subscribe to the channel on YouTube or Twitch, sh share the link, uh, say that you subscribe and tweet with the hashtag, otherwise uh, I won't find uh, your tweet. So uh, that's, that's pretty much it. And uh, while uh, our next speaker, so uh, Kyle and Caleb are getting ready. Uh, we've shown their screen and everything. Uh, we will, uh, yeah, start to to uh, to get ready. So, Kyle and Caleb, if you hear me, you can start sharing your screen, and we should have a transition uh, shortly. Well, I'm just waiting for them to share the screen first. But uh, yeah, so. If you have, uh, while I'm still like speaking, uh, if you have any uh, recommendation uh, for what to do, uh, what to change in the format, uh, if I keep doing live stream or all those things, 
just uh, just let me know like on Twitter or in the chat and uh, yeah that should be uh, that should be it so let me see the future is watching yeah, I just tried a couple times it was the same so Welcome to, to Opcode Virtual Summit. It's all good. There we go. All right, let me know when that's showing up for you. All right, Caleb, you want to request control for your portions? There we go. All right, ready when you are, Matt. Awesome. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, it's good morning for us, but depending on where you are, good day, good afternoon, good night. Uh, thank you for coming to our talk, Red Team Handcuffs. I'm Kyle Bachman, and I'm joined today by my colleague and friend, Caleb McGarry. Uh, this is our agenda for the talk. We're quickly going to get into who we are and we're gonna discuss the constraints put upon us as a red team inside of Microsoft, and then wrap it up with hopefully a little bit of time to address some questions. This presentation is going to cover some of the constraints put against us in our rules of engagement. Every red teamer at Microsoft has to sign a document that basically goes over things that we are not allowed to do. Examples of this include uh, harvesting personal information not related to our assessment, denial of service attacks without express written consent from our customers, and any other actions that may impact the business in a negative way publicly. We don't want to bring down services that are live, and we do not want to unnecessarily attack our coworkers and make them feel uncomfortable at work or that we're in any way spying on them. Some rules of engagement may feel like they cannot be overcome with determination and a positive attitude, but in most cases, any rule of engagement working against you can be overcome with a little bit of imagination and engineering effort. So Caleb and I are members of the Serpent Pen Test team. Serpent stands for Services Pen Test. We are a team of eight who are responsible for cosine, gaming, and devices. Cosine is basically everything that is Microsoft Windows that doesn't reside on your computer. So things like Windows Update or signing um, devices is basically our line of surfaces and all other hardware, um, including the security of our factories. And gaming is our Xbox line, Xbox Game Pass, um, Xbox Live, etc. So our LinkedIn's can be found here at the bottom. Feel free to uh, connect with us and reach out if you think of a question um, and we're already uh, out of time or you think of it tomorrow or something, feel free to ask it. So a quick definition here on handcuffs. We are going by that second definition where a rule of engagement is something to restrain us. So we are going by the restrained by definition for the purposes of this talk. And now we're gonna get into some of those handcuffs. I'm now gonna hand it over to Caleb who will go over our first handcuff and show how we as a team have overcome this restraint with engineering effort. Caleb. Sure, thank you, Kyle. So I'm going to try and use the real world example for each one of these limitations that we talk about and then relate to how we have to deal with it since we want to achieve the same goal. And so for this one, I'm gonna talk about Stuxnet. And I'm just happen to picking on this on Stuxnet because it was a long time ago and it's fairly well known, although this example applies to almost every modern malware campaign. When you're attacking a target as a red teamer, you have a goal of don't give any risk to the company obviously that you're attacking and you don't want to expose yourself you don't want to be detected prior to accomplishing your goal and so real world attackers often have the same goal however they have the advantage that they don't have to use resources that they control and this is important because when attackers think about their risks right they want to break into your company they want to be undetected and then they want to get your data or they want to do some action on objective but the way in which those risks matter to them is slightly different in how they matter to us it's for an attacker it's far more uh, important not to be detected in advance, right? Because they have a time investment, they have a tooling investment into their attack that they're going to use when they come at you. And if they are detected early on in their kill chain or early on in the kill chain, 
uh, that investment is wasted. And so oftentimes they'll use resources that they can use to hide who they are, that they can use to obfuscate where they're coming from, but they won't have total control over them. And that's not necessarily something that we can do. And Stuxnet is a famous example of this because I've got some domain names listed here that they used, but they also hosted out of servers, say from Germany or from places uh, that you know, were hard to figure out who they were or where they were coming from. And this is very common when we see actual attackers that come against Microsoft, right? They'll hide behind a VPN, they'll use a host out of, you know, uh, say a disputed region in Ukraine, they'll use a shady ISP, um, they'll use something, they'll compromise someone else's server and then they'll attack us from that. But there are some risks there. Obviously they don't control that environment and they are potentially exposing some of our data if they were stealing it uh, to someone else. And so this gets into why we can't do this. Oops, okay, cool. So um, we can't do this because we can't afford to have the risk of having our data leak externally, right? If I compromise an environment and I take some data out of there, which is pretty common, and it gets leaked ex externally as part of my attack chain, uh, I will actually cause a problem to our business, right? I'll have public impact to Microsoft. Whereas if an attacker compromises Microsoft and they steal some of our data and they take it externally, it doesn't really cause any issues to them, right? It may make the data that they stole less valuable to them, but it doesn't necessarily impact them in a super negative manner. And that's not something that I can afford to have happen as a risk. And so because of this, I have to maintain complete control over all the resources that I use uh, at any given time. Or I have to have at least complete control over all the data that goes in transit through those resources at any given time. And this causes some challenges, right? So if I'm hosting out of Azure, or say a cloud environment, like you're another company and you're hosting out of a cloud environment that your company uses. Uh, the blue team, they can cheat. They can simply go say, hey, uh, we see some traffic going to this Azure subscription. Oh, it's owned by the red team. This is the red team and therefore their response will be different. Or they'll say, hey, we see some traffic that's going to this IP. We know who owns that IP. It's the red team. And it may shorten the response time. And it will change the way the response works. And so as a red team, it's our job to be the sparring partner of the blue team. And so we want to force them to go through all the steps uh, as part of their incident response process. We need them to actually have the challenge of trying to figure out who that attacker is, of trying to gather telemetry, of trying to get a full memory dump because they are unable to rely on say network traffic or other indicators to figure out who we are. And, and that's harder uh, if, I have, if I cannot use a resource that is outside uh, their visibility boundary. Uh, the last item is also kind of important because it actually adds significant overhead cost to you as a red teamer. Uh, you have to be able to deconflict, and I'll talk about this a little bit further on uh, in this presentation with your blue team 100%, right? You don't ever want to run the risk that you are creating a real incident while you're doing uh, your attack. And so you have to make sure that the actions that you take are logged in such a way that if someone came back to you and said, hey, I need a 100% accurate timeline, you could provide one, and that that timeline would be uh, concrete in such a way that there would be no way that someone can say, okay, this is potentially not you. So the way we looked at this is we said, okay, we need to be able to operate outside the boundaries of our blue team. For the most part, obviously there are some scenarios where there will be data that is too sensitive that we don't want to have ever leave the uh, internal network. And I'll, I'll cover how we deal with that further on too. And we decided that, you know, based on the sensors and the control that our blue team has, right? So they obviously have things that they can collect from on host. So you have like uh, memory dumps, uh, event logging, uh, defensive tooling, which is deployed to the host, uh, isolation, these things that impact the host or the resource, be it PaaS or an IaaS uh, system uh, that they can use. But then there's also network collection. And so the network collection is a, a good indicator of who it is, right? If you can see traffic and it's going to say an IP and it's hosted out of say Panama and it just kind of terminates there in some small ISP, it's a lot harder to figure out who it is. And so what we've decided to do is to use infrastructure that is actually outside our boundary. Now we treat it a little bit differently, right? Cause we treat that infrastructure as that it's like pre-pwned that at any given time it is compromised. And so no credential that is used to manage it or set it up is ever used anywhere else. We then treat the data that goes through it as exposed data, right? So it has to be encrypted uh, using a standard that meets the internal company standard before it ever leaves the network. So this actually adds a fair amount of overhead to us because we have to design this into our tooling and I'll talk about this uh, later on. Um, but it allows us to then send data, have it go to say an untrusted resource and then come back to us without exposing what that data is. 
And then we're simply relying on scale to hide. Now, this forces the blue team to respond differently. I can't just say, hey, it's going to the red team's Azure subscription, it's that. This forces them to treat something when they find it as a potential real incident. And I have an implementation example here of Nginx pass through proxies. Uh, this is not necessarily how our tooling works, um, but it is a very simple example that you can set up if this is something you want to replicate inside your company. So continuing on, let me uh, kind of talk about how this works from a diagram perspective. So you've got your cloud providers and I've got a bunch of them listed here. Uh, these are just kind of the most popular ones. You should pick one that is local to your region of the world, somewhere where you have a fairly good working relationship and you might want to contact them and say, hey, are you okay if I am using your service for red team? Uh, one of the things that we have found is if it is that your blue team is treating it properly like a real incident, they might actually reach out to that cloud provider to potentially attempt to get telemetry. And so you want to account for that scenario. All right, we've got Microsoft and on the left side, uh, we've got say the server and then we've got our infrastructure, right? So our internal loot server, our C2 server, our, our ultimate, I guess, data stores have to reside on premises within our company boundaries, right? You don't want to, to post that somewhere. Don't use a Dropbox or a Google Drive or somewhere else, right? Um, but you, you want to be able to obscure who you are and where you're coming from. And so if you're doing like an Nginx pass through proxy, you'll have your implant or agent running on the box. And then you'll be talking to and from a cloud provider and you'll have that proxy, which is out there that takes that traffic and sends it back to you. And uh, you don't just want one proxy um, because if you have one, then you'll just say, okay, there's traffic going to this IP. What else is talking to this IP? Um, and they'll know that it's you, right? So you're gonna need to have multiple hops in the area. And for certain things, this does introduce the challenge of latency. And so you'll have to figure out how to deal with that um, and, and make your red teams uh, more planful so that when an operator takes actions, uh, those actions uh, are not going to fail because of latency. All right, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kyle. Awesome, thank you, Caleb. So our next handcuff is a restraint against attacking our coworkers' personal devices. So attackers obviously don't have any rules against attacking personal devices. They really don't distinguish. But as a red team at Microsoft, we do have a strong barrier against going after our coworkers' cell phones or personal laptops they bring onto campus. We also can hack random software companies to perform some kind of software supply chain attack against our employees, as that would also be against our rules of engagement and highly illegal in the US where we reside. So this matters because of the advent of bring your own device. Bring your own device results in loose boundaries between the personal and the corporate data in regards to cell phones and personal laptops. To maintain trust between our team, the company and our employees, we do not attack the non-company owned or issued devices. We have no desire to have our coworkers believe we're snooping around in their personal lives. In a lot of ways, a good red team engagement requires a good working relationship with our customers so that the bug closure process can run smoothly. It's also very common that we'll reassess certain highly critical teams because our schedule is based on risk, meaning you don't want to burn a bridge with somebody during the readout process over because you've overreached your boundaries and then have to come back around in six months or a year or a year and a half and have to meet with that person again in the future and work together with them. So our solution is quite simple. Uh, in many cases, we assume breach. What this means is we start most pen tests from inside our base corporate network, unless a public CTP is expressly requested or the service has a lot of internet facing perimeter surface area that should be assessed from a black box perspective. Uh, we assume breach because we have an assumption and have proven multiple times in the past that in a company with 140,000 employees, someone will inevitably always click the link for a phishing campaign. We then start our assessment from a view of the network that any attacker would have after a successful phishing attack and utilize the information, tools, and privileges of the common internal network user to then begin our attack chain and spread our influence over the target network. Our next limitation is based around tool set development. Um, I'd like to think that we're a well-funded team and you know we, we have great talent on the team, but there's only eight of us. And there are adversaries that Microsoft has to deal with that are more sufficiently budgeted than our red team and have a lot more people 
attacking our, our company 24 seven, 365. Adversaries are routinely building customized malware to target their desired end goal within Microsoft. Our ops are a very fast paced cadence. They can be as long as eight to 12 weeks or as short as two weeks, which gives us 10 whole business days. While the real bad guys out there can attack Microsoft for decades and have been. This really limits our flexibility when coding customized malware for our engagements. This results in a trade-off between what we are able to fully implement versus what we have to inform the customer via a tabletop or something of a risk that they have that we can't prove fully to exploitation at the time. But we do have a solution for this. Uh, it's, it's basically a solution via an effective partnership. We work with our blue teams and agree on what is signatured and how they signature the reuse malware that is built by our team. This allows us to still write customized tool sets, but not have to retool for every two week engagement. We, we have a concept of silent alerts that allow us to alert on our activity from our customized malware. So we're not creating and harboring zero days within Microsoft, but we're still able to effectively use our tooling before periodically aging some tooling out and, and coding new stuff. Uh, we make sure that we hire folks for our team who can code. Uh, the ability to code is seen as a certain level of literacy to be an effective red teamer because in, in every single assessment you ever do, there's going to be cases where manual effort won't fit within our time constraints. And, you know, you think of that movie hacker and how, you know, you're in the basement in the dark with the hoodie furiously typing away at the keyboard. Uh, like a lot of it is actually like squinting and scrolling and, and having to parse large file dumps or, you know, large, large file shares for secrets or credentials. And a lot of that is not viable within our time constraints, unless you can code parsers and regexers and, and, and be able to script up a lot of the things that you would otherwise do manually. Um, now I'm going to hand it back off to Caleb for another couple handcuffs. Sure. So one of the things that Kyle has kind of alluded to is that we have a fairly tight partnership with our blue team. And so our blue team is split into several different areas. So we've got uh, detections and these are the people that build say signatures. We've got hunt. These are the people that look for, uh, I guess, malicious actors in the network. And then we've got incident response. And those are the people that actually go out and do the eviction. And as part of our work, we want to test all three of those areas. And so although we do partner with them, there will be cases where we'll compromise a system and we'll want to do something bad to it, right? This is pretty common uh, as any sort of red team op goes. And so oftentimes adversaries will get on a box, right? And one of the first things they'll do if it's a Windows system is they'll say enable WGIGEST, right? And that will let them capture plain text passwords or they'll uh, enable skeleton keys. So that way they have some sort of backdoor that's present on the system. Uh, I've got some noted here that they'll drop say a web shell on the box and they'll use a commodity password or something common. So say GitHub malware. And the reason why they'll do this is one, it helps them uh, maintain persistence on the system, which is something they want to do. And that commodity malware may evade the defensive components. And so that's how they may deal with not having to retool for each time. If someone has built a tool out there that already works, they're going to use it. And then it will potentially also obfuscate who they are, right? It's very hard to do attribution if you find something and you go out and you look at what that web shell is and it's just some generic web shell off GitHub. You cannot use that file then as a signature or any sort of indicator for who the attacker might be. Now, you might over time realize that a certain subset of attackers prefer that sort of implementation, but it's not a solid indicator. And so it's something that they'll often do. We, on the other hand, can't really afford to do this. And so the reason is because when we're working with our customers and our partners, we can't have a system that is uh, weak. So hold on a moment. I need to click through. Next slide. Awesome. So because I don't ever want to like pop a box, make it weaker, and then have someone else pop it during the course of me doing my work, especially if we're doing like a perimeter compromise, right? And so we have a guarantee to our customers, and this is actually written in our rules of engagement, that any secrets or any data that we find, we will store in a the same state or a greater state of security from how we found it, right? So obviously this means we have a loot server, we have like kind of a sort of an enclave where we keep this sort of stuff, and then we have to figure out um, what are we going to do with the systems that we compromise, right? Um, one of our worst fears would be if we compromised a system and someone came in behind us on that same attack path, 
uh, and then there was an actual incident. And this has happened to red teams before, right? There are, are many known cases out there in the wild where people have taken over implant networks, particularly if you're using a commodity product like Cobalt Strike, um, where that network will get compromised by a third party attacker. And so being Microsoft, and as Kyle mentioned, we're kind of a code heavy engineering focused team. Uh, we do write the vast majority of our own tooling. We don't tend to purchase any sort of COTS product. Um, our tooling has to go through the same release process that any publicly available product from Microsoft does, right? So what this means is we are a red team and uh, we have a sister team, which is an application security team that does code review. And our tooling gets held up to the same standard of code quality as uh, a normal public product that they would review, right? So they're gonna check it for the same sort of flaws. They're gonna give us the same sort of bugs. We have to be able to deal with them, solve them and have the same sort of release process, right? And then obviously we have a deconfliction process internally. And so it's it's fairly standard as part of the incident response process that eventually there will reach a point in time where they'll want to know if it's a red team or not. And depending on how the operation is going, um, we may tell them, hey, this is not us or this is us, uh, depending on what we're doing. Um, but there is a, a time limitation there, right? So I have to be able to respond within a certain amount of time. I don't want to get an email from them and be like, hey, I'll get back to this tomorrow um, if in the event it is a real attacker, right? Because I need to know that they can continue to do their job and continue to respond uh, regardless of uh, what we are doing, right? Now, oftentimes we may actually find real malware on a system. This does happen occasionally uh, where you'll pop a box and someone else may have beaten you to that. So in that case, uh, we follow the standard incident response process. We terminate the test and then we do tell the blue team, hey, go do your job. And so those tests, obviously uh, we stay out of their way, right? Um, we do get involved somewhat in the incident response process to provide an attacker mindset but that's like a very small subset of our actual, um, I guess, job duties, right? And then lastly, if we find a, a critical vulnerability um, that is not an ODA, right? So ODAs are kind of unique because if I find an ODA in code, um, there are certain things that I can do to see if anyone else is potentially aware of that that ODA exists, right? And so ODAs actually represent, say, less risk in some cases. In some cases, obviously, there are exceptions to this rule than, say, an NDA vulnerability. Say I find an unpatched uh, Windows 2003 box that's sitting somewhere in an environment uh, that has been unmaintained and, you know, it, it is, say, publicly accessible or it exposes, say, important customer data. And I'm able to compromise it, right? Uh, I would tell the blue team right away. And so usually we have a partner or someone that in their chain that is aware of what our testing schedule is. And so it might be someone fairly high up, um, like an executive in some sort, but we will let that person know and then let them make the call whether or not they want to have someone on the blue team go immediately investigate that system to look for indicators of compromise. And this is important because we don't want to continue on doing the test if that box is already popped. The idea being that we are reducing the risk to the company. So Kyle mentioned earlier, and I'm kind of gonna to dig deep into this here because we have some specific tooling that I'm going to walk through how it works in a minute that we have built to deal with this problem. So our tests are time boxed, right? We don't have forever to go test anything. And because there's eight of us and we have a fairly large scope, when you say, just take us one component of our scope. So gaming, uh, we have all the game studios uh, in Xbox. And I think that's like 12 now. We have these, we obviously have Xbox itself. We have the services that support Xbox. And then we have any other say research or external things or, or whatever else they're working on. That alone could occupy the entire team for a year. And that excludes things like devices and cosine, which are also in our scope. Now, active malware people, people that are attempting to attack us, they will have automation. They will continuously be watching our environment. They will be waiting for that one slip up to get in. We don't necessarily have that opportunity, right? If there's a product that's coming out, I may have to test it prior to release. And so I will have a set schedule of not only when I have to test it, but of how long I have to test it. Um, and that's challenging for us, right? Um, I may have limitations or places, times when they would prefer I not test. Like, hey, uh, product release. But I have to be very careful that I don't cause any adverse business impacts. And so we have built some particular tooling that we use internally to deal with this. And so one of the things that I think that is important for every red team pen test, and this uh, obviously only applies to internal red teams, right? So consultant red teams won't be able to do this, but uh, we maintain persistence, right? The idea being that even though we, since we don't breach the perimeter every single time, as Kyle mentioned, we'll, we'll do an assumed breach. When we do breach the perimeter, which happens, I don't know, every few tests, depending on what the scenario is, we'll try and find places where we can maintain a foothold within the environment that we can potentially use 
later on to start our test. And this provides us several major advantages. It, it forces the hunt portion of the blue team to always be looking for that irregular signal, to be figuring out where we chose to stash um, our persistence, and then be figuring out where their telemetry gaps are, because we may be able to identify a system where there is no telemetry, establish persistence there. And so they'll have to make sure that their own internal tooling and processes are up to par in order to track where we've been and what we do. Uh, when we finish a test, we do tell them our attack chain, but we don't tell them everything, right? There is a, an internal decision uh, that gets made on what data to share, right? Um, we also have automation that watches a lot of things. So there is a, a, an entire tool set that I don't talk about here um, for helping us uh, do that reconnaissance portion in advance. So we try and shorten that as much as possible. And to do that, we have automation that we can run in, I'd say, a course of two to three hours, and I can get as much information about my target as possible. And that's broken into authenticated and unauthenticated data sets, and then we can decide what to use uh, as part of the test. And all this only works if you have a schedule, right? You have to know what you're going to test when, so then you can pre-stage some of your things, and you can be like, OK, we're going to activate uh, this persistence mechanism here, and we're going to use it. And so going on to our persistence mechanism and, and tooling, this is kind of what it looks like. And I don't have a code sample to share to you, because um, obviously this is an internal tool, and we're not uh, about to release it to the public. Um, but this is generally what the architecture design is like. And there are, I believe there are some uh, solutions that are out there that are somewhat similar that are open source. So on the, the left side of the document, we've got our targets. And so you've got servers, laptops, desktops, whatever. You've got the places where you're going to compromise. And this is where we'll put our persistence mechanisms is usually in what I consider an I as asset. So infrastructure as a service. Although you can um, compromise and persist in some PaaS, so platform as a service, uh, things too. But for the most part, right now, we target IaaS systems to persist in. And then in the transport area, uh, I've got, once again, cloud providers, as mentioned earlier, but I've also got other things. And I'm going to pick on one particular example here as part of this. And so, uh, so this little triangle thing with like uh, four dots and a, a couple of lines between it is, uh, I believe, Azure Artifact Service. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Azure Artifact Service, basically, it's a location that lets you publish like a package and then something can consume that package for use in their application. Uh, similar to NPM, NuGet, uh, et cetera, all the other package management repositories out there. And so what we're going to do is we have registered, say I went out and got a Hotmail account, I registered an artifact on Azure Artifact Service, and I have nothing there. All right, And this is kind of important. So one of the major advantages that this sort of uh, design has is that it doesn't require two-way communication. So uh, in the example that I presented earlier, using the multiple hops through the cloud, you have two-way communication, right? And so if you're custom writing your own sort of uh, encapsulation for that, uh, it gets hard because you have to track the state of that communication, the data that's going over. And if it's an unreliable transport, such as UDP, uh, you once again have to know when to resend and uh, request additional packets, right? Um, it's like basically you have a VPN. Uh, I do recommend everybody build one of those at some point in time using Python. It's just uh, it's a crazy experience, and it will teach you a lot about what goes into network protocols and design. Um, but you may not want to do that for your stuff. Now, with this design, we don't have two-way communication, right? Um, all our agent is going to do is it's going to check Azure Artifact Service, and it's simply going to say, is there a package there? Is there a package there? Is there a package there? And there might not be a package there for the vast majority of the time. And now when we do an op, we stand up a C2, right? And so this is some, you know, our custom internal tooling software. And uh, we have some storage. So we have, say, Azure Storage. We're using that as a queue. And we're going to want to activate uh, an implant uh, on one of these targets. All right? And this will work for things that need to either um, be inside or outside the corporate network. And so we're going to take our implant, and we're going to jump it in that storage mechanism. So we'll, we'll generate one on the C2. Our implants are custom generated for each target, because um, we bake in specific things like crypto keys, et cetera. And then we're going to put it on that Azure Artifact service. So I will publish an update. Right? And it's important if you note that there are also arrows to the other things, because I need to make sure that my implant is, or my persistence mechanism is still calling back. Right, and, and we'll do like long haul. Like I'll have a persistence mechanism that calls back maybe once a month. Right? Or maybe, I think, I think we have some that might call back like once every three months, in fact. Right? So they don't echo back very frequently. And they might be some, hey, we backdoored this like binary on a host, like paint, and it only launches irregularly when someone launches paint but it launches and it talks to one of these transports in such a way that I can get a log that says, hey, this called back, right? Because I have to know that it's still active. 
Anyways, I'll take my implant. Um, whoops, wrong button. And uh, I will then want to ship it to the through a transport down to the target, right? And so say email, right? Um, say I have a, a browser add-on that is dropped somewhere that checks you know, a Gmail account for new messages every 60 days, right? I'll send an email to it. That browser icon will see it. It'll download it. It'll execute that implant as a separate process often, right? So it doesn't maintain, doesn't stay within the same process. And then that implant will directly establish communications with the C2 and I can start my hopping off point. And so the advantage of this is that each one of these things are kind of separate, right? The controller, the storage, and the C2 and the stuff that manage in the back end. Yeah, that, that's a PaaS app, right? It can run on its own. It can be written in C sharp. And then the persistence mechanisms that run on the target, they can be customized throwaway binaries that are written for each area where I'm persisting, right? And they're small. They don't need to handle you know, a lot of communication. They just need to check for something. If there's something there, then they retrieve it. They check a cryptographic signature, and then they execute it, right? And that, that sort of thing gives me the ability to make a lot of small throwaway droppers where I can reuse bits of code. They're hard to signature for the blue team, and they can check different protocols and different transports, right? libcurl is a great library to learn how to use for this because it can talk over almost anything. Um, and then you can retrieve your implant, and you can do your activity. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to Kyle to wrap up. Kyle, you're muted. There always has to be one, huh? All right. So although our red team can have arbitrary constraints that a real adversary would not, uh, we can be just as effective, if not more effective, through our partnerships with the blue team and by being adaptive in the way we operate and think about attacking our assets. We have the privilege of attacking the same company over and over and over. This allows us to gain an internal knowledge of what works and how to do our job more efficiently when compared to the contract pen tester who is challenged to start from scratch with every new customer. In our team, we've heavily adopted the purple team mentality in an effort to use our internal knowledge, toolings, and partnerships to identify threats more efficiently than attackers and close them, hopefully, before the attackers can find them. This includes writing tooling periodically that will identify problems, not just in a small scope or on our target service, but at a systemic scale so that we can solve these problems for the entirety of the company and close gaps across hundreds of thousands of servers. If you're encountering problems due to your ROEs, think creatively about the situation. There may be an engineering solution or a team partnership that allows you to get to your end goal while still staying within the written confines of your contractual obligations. So I think that that is pretty much it. And we would love to open the floor up to any questions from anybody online. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for your talk. Actually, I do have uh, so, some uh, some questions. Uh, so there's something I always wondered: is how many red teams there are at Microsoft? Mm. Uh, I'll answer that, Kyle, if you're okay with it. So there are okay. what I would consider four main ones, right? And so the the areas of responsibility. Um, so there's an Azure red team, and they cover Azure services and Azure itself in general. There is M365, which generally covers Office and Office Client. And then there is a corporate red team, which covers some of the internal corporate systems. Um, all of them are fairly small, right? So uh, we do kind of meet together to share tooling. And we do, I guess, coordinate our development efforts on some of the major tools that we use. Um, and then occasionally, there's like one or two other people that may be doing red teaming exercises out there. Um, uh, but once again, that's the majority of the red teams at Microsoft. Yeah, I think when you talk about those one or two other people out there that are doing red team activities, some of our more major products will have dedicated attacker mindset security folks who will work on them. So like a big example is like SQL is a huge product, right? It's been in use for decades. That has its own kind of attacker mindset people that are constantly looking at it and ensuring every new update doesn't introduce old vulnerabilities or create new vulnerabilities. Yeah, oh, and I guess it's important to note that this excludes like client code security team, right? So there are separate, what I consider component pen test or code review teams for each product, right? So 
Um, red teams specifically do not do that activity. I mean, we do it as part of our attacks and our compromise. Obviously, we love to steal source and then look for bugs in it. But there are dedicated code review teams for each of our major products. And uh, others that works are like the blue teams are like uh, usually in the, like not in the same team, but do they work like uh, together or is it hard to, to communicate uh, sometimes with like some of the other teams or is it like completely like are they, just, are, are they like actually verticals, you know, like all those teams or is it more like silos? Um, so prior to Satya, I think things were very siloed, but under Satya, that siloing has more or less gone away. And so the way the blue teams work is they're like, is kind of like a shared incident response center and they all contribute people to them, um, to that area. Although each blue team has a designated area of focus, right? So for example, our blue team is intimately familiar with like the gaming studios, which may not even host at Microsoft, right? And mm -hmm. the technologies that they use, which might be third party cloud providers. Um, whereas say the Office 365 blue team is extremely familiar with Exchange and how it runs its platform, right? Um, a lot of times our incident response process may require a code change, especially if someone is deploying an ODA against us and the blue team needs to have super in-depth knowledge, not just of the environment in which uh, they are trying to, the infrastructure runs, but also of the software that they are attempting to, you know, protect. Um, but the blue teams all contribute like a shared resource on a fairly regular basis to this like shared response center, I guess. Um, and then from there, they can coordinate and work with each one of the red teams. Now, that said, we do have a partner blue team that works directly against us, right? So their name is Fire, and we're Serpent, right? And we attack resources primarily that they defend um, to, trust, to test them and their capabilities to respond within that area. Um, I think that's an answer to your question. Kyle, do you want to add anything there? Yeah, I think as far as communicating with the blue team, um, over the last five years that I've been uh, pen testing at Microsoft, I've seen the relationship become a lot more collaborative versus combative. When I first mm -hmm. got there, there's a, a large us versus them mentality. And now I think a lot of that's gone away. And, you know, I've, I've worked with this blue team for nearly five years. I consider a lot of them, you know, really good friends and they're right down the hallway. And, you know, you might be hiding from them at 1115 deploying malware and 1130 you're going out to lunch with them. You know, Hey, how's, how's life? How's it going? How are the kids? So it's just, it's kind of funny. Um, but then also, you know, when, when the proverbial shit hits the metaphorical fan, right. And we have bad guys in our network that are overlapping with one of our pen tests. And this has happened before we are not allowed to pen test anymore. That is it. We don't want to muddy the water. We don't want to make their job more difficult so that they'd have to pick and choose. Okay. This traffic looks like Kyle versus this. We have no idea. Um, so, I mean, at that point we're not busy anyways. And if it, if it gets bad, like our attacker mindset can be used in a defensive way and lending our attacker mindset to our blue team in a time of need, it's, it's, it's a really fun exercise. And I feel like as an attacker, I learn a lot from these periods of times where I'm not allowed to attack anything because I'm getting to, you know, kind of shoulder ride the real thing. So I, I think that's a cool collaboration between our two teams. And what about the, uh, the purple team? Is it like a third separate team or is it just like whenever you do like joint exercise? Yeah, it's no, th like that, that's more of a process. Um, the purple team is more of a process. It's usually when we do joint things where a red team is going to be black box, not announced. One person on the blue team might know so that they can deconflict if it gets bad, but the rest of the team has to treat it like it's real. Whereas a purple team, we're really going through um, security promises with our customers, what they think they're doing right, how they think they're doing it right, what guarantees they're making themselves and their customers, and then sitting down with our blue team and going, okay, yeah, so promises one, three, and five, they're good. Two and four, they think they're doing a good job, they're not. And we're going to prove it. We're going to go attack it right now. See if you see anything. Or right, I'm going to go back to my desk. And and you know it's it's a it's a way to get a more comprehensive test of a product's security than a red team, where because a red team reveals a risk, and a red team will give you the why you need to do security. But at its base, a red team engagement is usually the fastest way in, the fastest way out. You know, it's, it can be anything from a smash and grab to a long kind of low troll where we're trying to be silent and and get that persistence. So there's there's a variance to the the noise or the aggressiveness of a red team. 
but a purple team is going to be pretty consistent, pretty comprehensive. Imagine a chain where you start, you find a vulnerability here to get to your end goal. Well, okay, we, we do that. We talk to the customer and our blue team, we fix this vulnerability. We start back up here again. Okay, well, there's this other thing over here. Okay, and then we get to the end goal. Okay, now we fix this. Now we have this thing over here. So whereas a red team's only gonna test that one chain, you know, one objective, and then the test is gonna wrap up. A purple team's gonna be more comprehensive in that we are going to basically file the bugs we find as we find them, discuss them in our weekly standups with the customer we're assessing, and our blue team is going to be able to kind of ride the whole the whole show, and it's I think it's a good process. I feel like our, our bug quality from those are, are fairly high. I see. And just uh, so so if I understood the correctly, so the serpent team is customer facing, or when you say our customers, you just mean generally uh, for the products. Uh, yeah, this this actually uh, everybody this confuses everybody. Uh, when I mention our customers, I am talking about Microsoft services and cosine devices. Okay, or, okay, or, okay. So they, they are our customers, but yeah, it is not public facing. And and what's the name of the blue and red team at uh, Azure? Uh, so no. the Azure team is called uh, Art Azure Red Team, and I think their blue team is simply called Azure Blue Team. We have the coolest okay. name. Yeah, cool so thing, I was cool. about to say, like, is, 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 uh, this is what, like, Serpent, Fire? Serpent yeah. and Fire is our, that's our red and blue team. Okay, okay. What, what, what about the, the, the team of uh, Dave Weston with, uh, with Jordan and everything? What's their name? So they are, they are like the client security offensive team, right? Um, so his team does, like, security mitigations and defensive measures that are on the Windows product that is on your desktop. Right. Yeah. And so that's, that's their scope. Right. Yeah. So, um, it's, it's slightly different. Whereas Kyle, Kyle, I'll let you explain a little bit what our scope was again. So again, our scope is anything windows, not on your computer, anything devices like which Azure sphere, for instance, Azure sphere, for instance. Okay, cool. Yeah. So any, 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 uh, any tips for people who are trying to get the code execution in the Pluton subsystem? None that we're willing to share. <laughs> I mean, so, so like, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, no. What, what, what about um, say, getting like serial debugging on it? Like any, any tips? <laughs> we, uh, I think, we cannot I think provide you with you any tips. tips we wouldn't be point. allowed to talk publicly anymore. I know, I know, I know. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. Um, cool. Uh, this is a question from uh, Ale uh, Alex uh, in the chat. It's like, uh, what is the coolest uh, logo? <laughs> uh, we have the best logo. Yeah, we definitely have the best logo. Is is it the red one from like the first slide? It is. Yeah. We is, have it a, a, is it designed internally? That's a good question for Alex. Because it's true. I saw it. I was like, it's kind of cool. It looks like some like. HackerCon like a uh, logo, you know? Yeah. So we've got that. We're making t-shirts, you know. We're all getting the tattoo. Uh, it's like uh, <laughs> it's like the people at Immunity when they used to get the Immunity uh, logo tattoo. But it was an easier one to make, you know. That one uh, is probably going to hurt a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, what's nice about the logo is it, it shows that Serpent actually stands for something. And we're not just trying to be cool. So like, we'll go into our presentation and be like, oh, Serpent team. Oh, services pen test. I get it now. You know, it's kind of yeah, a background. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's pretty good. Also with the PCB type of uh, thing in the background. Yeah, definitely you're going to ask Alex if it was done uh, internally, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a good one. Well, uh, there's uh, no, no more questions. So any last words, uh, guys? Um, I guess I'm going to offer like, uh, you know, this is a community of people that have a strong interest in offensive security and it's pretty awesome. And I would encourage you to continue along that chain. Like one of the things that we need in this area is diversity, right? We need people that are innovative. We need people that are creative, people that want to solve the hard problems of the future. And, you know, our team is fairly static. We haven't really had anybody join or leave the team within a couple of years, but there will come points in time where we will need new talent and new minds from the industry. And so um, I would just say, you know, thank you for having us on and please continue to do what you do. It is important for the security, 
not just of Microsoft, but for all the, the world, really. It does have an impact, and we do appreciate your efforts. Yeah, I guess all I would add is that, uh, you know, when I first joined Microsoft, I was a little skeptical. Um, you know, I imagined, you know, kind of large corporation, lots of suits. It, it wouldn't be my thing. But after getting kind of my feet on the ground and getting going, I realized this is, this is a place I could potentially work for life. And the team culture, at least within my security organization, is solid and collaborative and, and like a big family. I mean, uh, like Alex and Caleb were at my wedding, you know, it's, it's not like I just see these guys from, from nine to five, like we're, we're actually close. And, uh, I think that's important when you want to have a, a job that you, you enjoy and yeah, I mean, it's been a, a great place to work and a challenging atmosphere. So, uh, just wanted to say like my, my assumptions about pen testing in large corporate environments were definitely changed. Yeah, no, definitely, uh, definitely when uh, a good company to be at. Well, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, thanks again, guys, uh, for speaking and uh, joining us. Uh, well, I hope to uh, talk to you soon. And next time I'm in Seattle, I will uh, come say hi. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Our thanks, pleasure. Guys. Well, uh, now we are back uh, for the uh, second part of uh, our uh, agenda. And uh, while everyone is getting uh, <laughs> every, everyone is getting ready and uh, hyped up, I guess uh, I just need like Ruskan to put his uh, webcam. So again, just a quick uh, reminder for uh, people who missed uh, the, the first part. Uh, if you do want uh, to win a, a free ticket for uh, Black Hat um, next week, I'm just trying to find my windows. I have so many windows open now. I'm, I'm kind of lost actually. Uh, on that one. And yeah. So uh, yeah, just check on the Twitter uh, for the rules of the, uh, the contest. But basically, uh, very straightforward. Just say that uh, you uh, registered and subscribed to the uh, either the YouTube or the Twitch channel and use the hashtag so I can find you on Twitter uh, after the panel uh, and then uh, I, I will pick up uh, someone uh, for uh, the, the winning ticket and uh, yeah so that's uh, that's that's pre pretty much it just launching the uh, trans future is watching. Welcome to Opcode Virtual Summit. And yeah, and uh, we we are back on the uh, on the thing. Cool. Hi, uh, Mark. Hi, Anastasia. Can you hear me? Okay. Hey, hey. Hi. Yeah, hello. Hey, cool, cool, cool. Everything is working good. Um, and I guess we can start. Yeah, let's just make sure like Ruslan, yeah, and do you hear us? I do hear you. I cannot turn on my video though. Oh, oh. let me check. Maybe I touched something that I should not have touched. Oh, there we go. Okay, okay. That's Hello. should okay. be better now. Hello. Excellent. Cool. Well, let you uh, introduce uh, each of you. So let's start with uh, with Mark, since he's going to be the, the main uh, moderator and is going to be driving the, the discussion. A pleasure. So uh, my name is Mark. Mark Carney is my real name. I'm not the governor of the Bank of England, although I wouldn't mind the salary, to be honest with you. Um, so uh, I work as a security researcher, and I do a lot of work in and around cryptography. Uh, you may know me from such controversies as um, writing a lot of maths to do with uh, uh, the uh, crypto flat earthers at uh, Black Hat last year. So, uh, 
that's something that I did. But no, this is a, a really good opportunity. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Uh, let me be like the uh, next one. Uh, so hello, my name is Anastasi and yeah, I'm like excited to join. Like Mark, thank you. And Matt, thank you too. It's like a cool idea to do like small AMA. So my background is, uh, I have a typical computer science background and I'm software developer. But the thing is that I switch to like data security and software security a little bit. So I would say that I'm a software developer with like specific uh, specialization of like applied cryptography and data security. And I work at Cosac Labs and what I do is I just make sure that the data is stays uh, stays encrypted and like protected for different kind of applications across different kind of infrastructures, languages and technological stacks with different, you know, like databases, uh, coding, like languages, I told it again. So, yeah. Um, and today, uh, like my approach and like uh, my perspective would be more about um, applied stuff and like uh, how cryptography looks like from software development point of view and what, I know, what software developers typically look at and what they completely miss. Yeah, thank you. Ruslan. Hey, uh, right. So my name is Ruslan and uh, I'm originally also from Ukraine. Uh, I studied cryptography back in Ukraine as well. And uh, for a while after that, I worked uh, in a team that was developing a new cipher that later became a, a national encryption standard uh, back in Ukraine back in 2015. Um, after that, I kind of shifted more towards software engineering because I really liked the much shorter uh, feedback loop. Right, you don't have to wait for years to to get some results in. Uh, so I guess uh, we are moving to the same spot, trying to fill in the gap between software engineers and cryptographers. It's just me and Anastasia kind of coming from different directions to the same spot, right? She's coming from computer science, I'm coming from cryptography, both to software engineering. Yeah, and it was actually really fun because we, uh, Ruslan and I, we met each other in real life. And last year, you know, when like real conferences was a thing. We actually like I was one of conference organizers at Nonicon security conference and Ruslan was on stage explaining the details, details of designing this Ukrainian uh, cipher. It was really cool. These uh, these real life conferences, I've I, I've heard of these. They say they sound like a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have some memories, you know. <laughs> yeah, the distant ones from a long, long time ago. Uh, but yeah, so thank you uh, both for sort of coming along. Um, my background is in mathematics, but like not in cryptography. So I, I miss and don't know certain things. And then other things I'm like, this is quite straightforward. This is, this is really nice. So it's nice to have like sort of a good spread of like sort of activity and interest and people who are doing some really cool stuff. I really love what you're both doing. So thank you very much. So I, I thought we'd start with a really easy question, um, which I got from uh, Javier, which was, um, what is your favorite crypto algorithm and why is it base 64? Well, for, for me, it's definitely base 64. Like this is the best. And okay, so so disclaimer, right? Um, I, I maintain one of these open source cryptographic libraries and we have really, really a lot of questions coming from developers, uh, questions that they can't, you know, like decrypt the data. And usually like typically 99% of cases is not an encryption mistake, is encoding mistake. Because, you know, data encoding, when data is encrypted, it's two large topics mixed together. And this is like a real source of confusion. Yeah, so I think that leads us into, the, into a good question, Ruslan. Um, it's kind of a generic question that I get uh, asked quite a bit, uh, or I see coming up quite a bit, is how do you like assess and maintain and choose a cryptographic library for an application? So you have to, you're a developer, you know you need to do some encryption. But, but how do you work it out, Ruslan? Where do, where do you start? Right, so I guess it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If it's uh, what I would call a commodity crypto, right? It's basic encryption, uh, basic uh, signing, or like something that's already well-developed and well-studied, uh, you already have some mainstream choices, right? And you should obviously choose a well-established popular library, even if there are some vulnerabilities that will get discovered there later on, they will be quickly fixed and it's going to be a big deal. You're gonna learn about it. 
So it's pretty simple. You choose either open cell or Lipsodium is another popular choice nowadays. There is also Google Stink library. Uh, you basically just go with with the mainstream. The problem is, what do you do when you are looking for some very niche kind of crypto, which doesn't have much implementations in like mainstream libraries? For that, I would say um, there is no like universal silver bullet. Uh, you gotta look at uh, what's already there and uh, who wrote it, what kind of background the people had. Um, what I would want to warn you about is if something is written by a cryptographer, it doesn't mean that this is necessarily a secure implementation because just like developers sometimes make mistakes by not understanding crypto and they implement it, cryptographers make mistakes by not knowing the software engineering language enough. Uh, so it's sometimes there's always a risk of, of hand vulnerability. So you use your best ju judgment. That's a really important point. Anastasia, how do you, how do you work? Yeah, uh, again, like here I'm like super biased because uh, I want of this, you know, my intent is, I don't know, let's say contributors of open source library Temis, which is basically like a layer above like boring SSL, open SSL, etc. So I totally agree with Ruslan. Uh, sometimes if you want to do just simple things, use like native cryptographic libraries available for language and for a stack. However, often when applications are like multi-platform, it can get tricky to make sure that all your code across all these platforms can actually encrypt and decrypt the data, right? Because the native libraries can be different and their APIs are different. And the APIs usually are made by cryptographers. So I would say it can be a little bit tricky to put all these parameters, you know, like lengths and buffers and think about padding and other things. So yeah, and uh, to address this, for example, like we, we made Tamis to address this particular use case when you need to do like something for like multi, uh, as a cryptographic library for a multi-platform application. So that leads nicely into a question, which is actually from uh, Robert Buchanan um, on uh, YouTube. Where he's saying sort of can i be a casual cryptographic enthusiast you know do i need lots of mathematics like how much crypto does a developer actually need to know to actually do some to develop a reliable and kind of robust solution in the real world like a uh, question to either of you i would say that if you don't mind i'll start um i would say that it depends on your background like are you a computer scientist then i think even if you're missing some math, uh, most of it you can pick up pretty, pretty quickly. If you come from completely different background, uh, it might be a little bit uh, more complicated. And then I would recommend, uh, you know, to stick to the standards and uh, just use whatever um, math and algorithms and parameters are defined there, uh, just to make sure, because even cryptographers sometimes screw that up. Uh, if you want to understand, though, there are there are some good books that kind of walk you through and introduce all the necessary mathematics. So if you just put enough time, you can uh, certainly uh, pick up and, uh, and understand the things. Unless you go into like quantum cryptography stuff, which is a little bit more complicated and requires physics as well. I would also add that uh, maybe on a high level, you don't even need to dig into math really a lot if you want if your goal is you know like to, to make uh, to secure data for example in your application right maybe you don't need to read about math and maybe you don't even sorry for me saying that but maybe you don't even need to fully understand how ciphers work right but what you need to have is a basic understanding of risks and threats because cryptography it's not like it's it's not like a magic you know wand that will make your data protected no if you encrypt the data even using like best of the best cipher but you put the encrypted data and the key in the same place sounds silly but it's like typical mistake sorry right even if you're good like have a good mathematical background but you don't use these things correctly sorry if you're building like a um, multi-platform system huge infrastructure but you can't make sure that the data is encrypted all the time. And on some point, it's like plain text, for example, and it's getting into logs, it gets into backups. Sorry, your cryptographic knowledge doesn't you know, help you here because it's like more high level stuff, more like risk management stuff. Yeah, there's, there seems to be a, there's, there's a lot of um, plumbing, engineering, like sort of stuff that you need to be aware of and that you need different inputs in. 
So it, it's kind of like, I mean, there's a nice comment from Robert Buchanan saying sort of, is, is crypto a lifestyle? And I think actually maybe... Maybe it is. I don't know how glamorous it is, uh, but I, uh, I, w- I would not judge me. Uh, yeah, I would not judge you based on me. But I think, do, do, do you agree that sort of it, it's a thing you have to immerse yourself in if you're going to do some of it and you have to like keep aware of it? Like, uh, how much do you end up doing a sort of a week by week? Like, do you live, breathe crypto? I know you probably both do, but uh, how much should I do if I was a developer? I'd say if you're uh, just like with security, crypto is also part of security and that's the process. So you, yeah, <laughs> so you kind of just want to stay, um, stay aware of what's going on around you for sure. Yeah, I agree. And as a process, it has no end, right? And what I really like right now is that uh, there are so many exciting things in cryptography, uh, like zero knowledge proofs, zero, zero knowledge snarks, right? Some, some things like post quantum, right? Uh, that only few people understand and it's so fun to read and you know try to apply the thing so at the same time you kind of can have this uh fear of missing out because the industry the industry is expanding there's so much research going on right and at some point you can say that yeah i do have this knowledge but i have completely like nothing i do not know like anything about this domain at all i think i need a t-shirt that says crypto fobo i think i need that uh as a thing in my life. We might have to get onto Teespring after this and uh, sort of get, get some stuff going. But I think that's a really important point that there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, we saw that NIST are now down to their selection round last week. So, um, you know, uh, what was DES became AAS and now we're into the next one, whatever they're going to call that. Uh, so like, you know, th- this is an ever evolving theme. So one question um, that came up uh, in the kind of the pre-sale uh, for this was, um, so how do you, how do you, choose and maintain good knowledge for TLS ciphers. That seems to be quite a hot topic. A lot of people were clicking this on the vote on Twitter earlier. So like TLS is obviously everywhere. We're trying to get everyone from TLS 1.2 up to 1.3 and it's kind of edging slowly and taking over. Um, I'm, I'm sure we all here are aware of the benefits of TLS 1.3, but like sort of where do I start like choosing ciphers? What should I avoid? What's good and what's bad? Uh, I'll, I'll take any flaws and I've got some input afterwards. So the best uh, thing about TLS 1.3 is that you don't have to think about that much uh, uh, about the cipher suits anymore, right? Because we used to have around 20 of those. Now we would just have five. And uh, most of those are just variations of the AES. So uh, I guess the best advice would be upgrade to TLS 1.3. The problem is that most, uh, you know, you cannot uh, get rid of all of your clients who are still not compatible. So you will have to uh, to to maintain uh, one to two for a while as well. Uh, for that, I would say um, there are already some people who put a lot of <laughs> engineering effort and thought to do that and created recommendations on, uh, you know, which ciphers use and which particular uh, engine X or whatever server you use configuration you should use. And uh, you should just gui- be guided by that, uh, by those recommendations. I know Firefox has a great website to just, you you put in what you want and it'll show you like server configurations that you can just copy paste. I think that's the best thing to do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And uh, the guide uh, from SSL Labs, right? With like huge description of uh, what you can choose. And yeah, I also agree with Ruslan point that unfortunately, like we're excited about TLS 1.3 and we want everything to work with that. Sorry, we live in a real world with a real application, with the real infrastructures. Imagine that some uh, like uh, databases like uh, Postgres or MySQL almost like recent versions or maybe like uh, latest minus one still does not support 1.3 at all so even if you really want to you just can't uh, update to new tls until you upgrade all these versions you know of your like software of your databases do proper migration make sure that you solve all the use cases just to upgrade the tls version I think there's also some, so when uh, when PCI DSS uh, changed their regulations that you had to drop, I think it was TLS 1.0 at one point, or TLS 1.0 and 1.1, um, a lot of people had the same solution, which was just, well, we'll put a Netscaler in front of it, and then that will do the TLS, and then I don't have to worry about it. But then you also have to consider, well, what if that goes down? If that goes down, then you're exposing the really bad 
TLS again. And, and you know, you need to you need to take into account all the things that could go wrong that you can foresee going forward. Look at your threat model, look at your attack surface, and just really pay attention that the, the crypto is not just appropriate, but also that if things go wrong, then things are, you know, so that there's things behind it that'll hopefully back it up and uh, keep you safe and keep your clients and customers safe. So I think that what yeah. you're saying is really important. Yeah, uh, uh, you remind me uh, about Apple approach, right? So if you're like iOS developer and you want to submit your iOS application, uh, you need to use certain TLS ciphers and what TLS suits and what Apple does. They just deprecate. Uh, I, I believe they deprecated 1.0, 1.1. So right now you can choose from, I'm maybe mistaken about 1.1, but I think you can choose from 1.2 or 1.3 only. You just can't you know, upload the application if you use like bad old TLS, right? And what and basically their approach is uh, similar to what regulations do in a market. But the difference is that Apple is like a huge, I know it's called like vendor of this kind of ecosystem and they push users like developers to update uh, the TLS they use. It's like, you know, this kind of approach It's not like just a regulation or like laws, but no, we will strictly like disable these things for your, uh, just to make life easier for everyone. What do you think about that kind of thing, Roslan? How do you temper like uh, real world requirements with cryptographic kind of best practice? It's always the trade-off, right? It's uh, like in security and risk management, you cannot uh, eliminate all the risk. Uh, so, uh, it always, um, you, I think for most, if you're working in a company, right, if it's not your pet project or your uh, kind of, I don't know, uh, some some non, um, non-financial stuff, right? If you're doing it for profit, then I think it should be driven by uh, business requirements for sure. Like you cannot say, we're not going to support this client because they are in TLS 1.1 if they're your largest client and paying you the most money, unfortunately. Like we would wish to, but that's the reality. Uh, so, but then when you do have to support these like legacy clients, right? You do want to make sure that uh, you uh, provide configuration for the server or whatever it is that um, kind of mitigates the known threats. And that's where it actually creates a new, more interesting um, engineering challenges, I would say, because everyone, it would be very simple to just say, hey, use the latest, greatest stuff, which does not have any uh, known vulnerabilities, but you got to sub- figure out how to protect the stuff that's older. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I also believe that uh, like cryptographers and uh, crypto engineers and those who work in academia, they are very different. Like this is separate bubbles, right? From like software developers. And sometimes uh, things that makes uh, things that make me excited about like crypto- in cryptographical sense, they just nonsense for software developers because they live in a different world because they just can't use these things yet it's not, the library is not there uh, it's like they use cases to narrow and we should think about performance so right so i would say that uh, probably again depends on threat model yada yada but probably uh, for applications that operate on sensitive data or that work in certain industries, you might want to use, you know, like industry proven, old fashioned a little bit, like ciphers and ways, uh, like standard, I would say. And for like smaller applications, maybe for more like startup, like um, maybe for like pet projects, you can experiment with new and exciting things, Uh, but just try to measure amount of like money in fines if you use something new that will be broken recently, right? I mean, that leads me to a question um, that I kind of had in mind, kind of more broadly speaking. So, um, like, there are now frameworks like OWASP ASVS is uh, one particular um, uh, framework I'm going to reference here. Um, and I know people who, who've worked on that, and they're really smart, really good people um, who have sort of produced this thing, which is like there's three levels. And if you're at one level, you need to do certain things. So I think is, is I want to put the question to both of you. Is the question more that we have to like sort of uh, find levels of, well, if you're ASVS level three, say, then you should be doing this kind of crypto there. You have to use TLS 1.3 and you make it mandatory. 
there. But if you're doing things at ASVS level one or something with a, with a, with a reduced threat model and reduced attack surface, and then, and then you can sort of uh, break away from that. Would, the, would that be a worthwhile exercise to try and show people that, uh, you know, crypto isn't an absolute either. Like there's actually various shades and various things. What do you, what do you guys think of that kind of thing? Does that show you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, personally, I believe that this uh, this idea is, is really great. It's super useful. Uh, of course, when you have only three layers, you kind of oversimplify things, right? Because every like application infrastructure and like business goals are different. But still, when you have these three levels, you can measure uh, how much effort you can put into security and you can talk with like business people, business owners, and to show them uh, the levels, to show them which uh, ISWs like uh, questions you should like, you should consider done, right? If you are application on this level. So I, I really believe this is like this is a very good idea and this is a very good tool. And but yes, again, this is like oversimplification. So yeah, for most application it will work and I really like it. Yeah, I agree that the default approach for sure should be kind of this pres prescriptive prescriptive instructions like you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this just to achieve some minimum level because it's very exciting always for, you know, for cryptographers, for someone uh, who's enthusiastic about security in general to kind of dig in and figure out, okay, what we need, what, what are the best tools we can use, what, what's, uh, you know, what's the best approach here. But often, especially like for startups, uh, they are not, Security is not their concern. Security is just something that they need as a side effect of, you know, of, of, of providing their core uh, core value. Uh, and in that case, unless you're going to just very explicitly instruct what they should do, right? They're not gonna dig deeper and, and figure out what uh, what, what kind of library or, or what, what kind of level of protection they should uh, implement. Uh, so because you know that's that's their that's not their intent. They are doing something completely different, which is providing value to the business. But um, it's still they still gotta protect it, and they wanna they always want to make the minimum effort possible to meet some kind of uh, of security. So. Uh, instructions you got to do this and that would definitely help in this scenario that's a really important point and also i see so we're talking about startups is a really interesting one because i mean crypto is more than just ciphers it's more than just you know block modes and uh you know sort of uh, cool algorithms and lots of math floating around there's also a sort of things like key management identity management that kind of thing so what are your views kind of on things like uh, Vault by HashiCorp? There's another one that I can't remember the name. Is it KeepSafe? I can't remember now. But there's there's a few out there that are coming. They're cloud-based and they let you sort of, so, the, so you, know, you can't compromise a, a password for a thing because the password has changed every eight hours or something. So like, how do you feel about things like that, that sort of manage keys and basically try and create a kind of zero trust environments even within the cloud where, you know, sort of, crypto APIs and crypto keys and uh, sensitive secrets are kind of hidden away. How do you, uh, what, what are your takes on uh, that kind of engineering? Uh, I believe that th this question itself can can start, you know, like a long holy war discussion. Because, yeah, I, I really like this question. Uh, I, I would answer like, you know, typical, um, I know, security architect would answer, depends. Right, so it depends. It depends on your like risk and threat models. Uh, first, like personally, from my like my personal experience, personally, I was uh, very, you know, I didn't trust this kind of solutions a lot because, like, imagine you put some data, you give like keys to some cloud infrastructure that is not part of your infrastructure, you can't control that, you don't know what's going on there, you have this insider risk for them, right, to be broken, all the things, and maybe it doesn't suit everyone, but then. I kind of changed my mind a little bit uh, because think about it from different perspective. Uh, if you're like a company and you don't operate on a lot of like sensitive data, so security is your concern, but not like huge concern, right? Uh, instead of having your own security engineers and your own team uh, like working and managing like internal key management solutions like public infrastructure for example you just kind of outsource these to trusted authority and you can spend time of your team of on security efforts but different like in, for example application level encryption right you can add something more valuable like you can spend time of your people in more valuable way 
then just re-implement things that someone can do for you. And technically, they do have a whole team working on these issues day by day, right? So you won't have the same level of like engineering forces. So I think when it comes to um, to choosing whether it should be on-prem or in private server, private cloud, whatever, uh, we often fall for what's called uh, zero risk uh, bias. And uh, that's what actually causes, uh, you know, like people in the United States to uh, buy out all toilet paper and like hoard food when when the quarantine hits, right? Basically, when we are uh, when we are faced with a lot of risks that we can mitigate all of them, uh, what people try to do instead of kind of mitigate a little bit each of the risks, so to kind of bring down the level of the threat, uh, what we do we tend to eliminate the simple risk, which which we can eliminate, right? So you can buy as much toilet paper as you want and stock up for the next year and not have to worry about it like at all. Uh, but then there's nothing like that's not doing anything with the coronavirus threat. Uh, and same here, when people say that no, we cannot afford by any, you know, in any scenario to deploy in AWS or de de deploy cloud based HSM or something like that, I think that's related, right? So you say this is a, a risk that we are mitigating like 100%, uh, but then you still have a lot of risk uh, connected with running stuff on prem, you still can get hacked and basically the reality is that the cloud provider might be uh, much better trained and much better prepared to support the functionality that you need versus you just figuring it out and deploying on-prem. So you, while you are completely mitigating one risk, which is like third party being hacked and you've been affected by it, you still have a lot of other risks to think about and we should kind of um, you know, treat them equally. So how do you then deal with things like, um, so I've, I've read on the internet, I read on the, and that means it must be true, Okay, I exactly. read on the internet that we should all be worried about quantum, right? <laughs> I was hoping we would have enough time for this. <laughs> <laughs> so this, so this, this does actually come up, like sort of, you know, just as in, in in the sciences, like sort of there are kind of there are fads, there are moments of things that are sort of being really popular. There's a lot of people really talking about quantum a lot at the moment. So let's just put the question there. I think they were, uh, we have our answers. Um, how worried should anyone be about quantum? Uh, I'll have to go first. I believe that we should be worried about climate change more than about quantum computing, to be honest. That's my like personal approach. But uh, I would recommend to watch uh, some talks by Jean-Philippe because he has like really amazing presentation on quantum computing and or, like quantum safe cryptography, right? And he basically outlines which ciphers will be broken in which way and what shall we do. So like increase key lengths, for example, or like sw or switch to quantum safe cryptography. And also I like to uh, keep an eye on Cloudflare because last year, for example, they did like huge work on changing some uh, things in like in TLS key negotiating to quantum safe, right? And they have this huge um, blog post describing which ciphers they took and how they measure results. AWS have their post quantum psych SIKE, don't they, as well, and things like that that they sort of worked and pushed through. So I think I think there's there's interesting options that you can do to kind of quell that fear. Ruslan, well, how do you approach this uh, this question? There are also a few other existential threats that we need to face, right? Uh, it could be an asteroid or it could be a uh, explosion of the sun, which will definitely happen. Uh, but we still have some time. So uh, I think uh, in quantum, uh, post quantum hype, I think I, I'm taking a less popular approach where uh, basically I think that it is important to research um, the mess, which has been done for, for a while now for sure, um, because the, the mess to actually break like factorization based algorithm existed like for decades. Um, but we still need a quantum computer to, to run it because right now the algorithm is abstract, right? We don't have a actual hardware to run it. And we moved from having quantum computer with zero qubits like around 30 years ago or so to uh, quantum computers having 100 qubits uh, nowadays, um, talking about quantum computers that can actually run those kind of uh, algorithms. To actually uh, be a threat to cryptographic algorithms, we would need to have millions of qubits run reliably on the, on the, on the quantum computer. Uh, I'm not a quantum physicist, but I do, I do like physics. So, so there is just a little bit of intro here. 
so I think right now, if you're a company or if you're basically a developer who's implemented stuff, you shouldn't be concerned about it in any way. Uh, the research community, the academic community, they are concerned. They are uh, researching uh, new algorithms that are uh, resistant to post-quantum, uh, uh, to quantum threat, right? And NIST uh, has, uh, is in the process of uh, choosing the standard that you know, that would be, uh, if we ever need to, to uh, face this threat, right, you would already have a standard available for you to, to that's researched and, and you can implement it. Uh, so it's great to talk about, it's uh, important for the research, but for the applied stuff, it's not yet, you shouldn't be focusing on that because the reality is, is you probably will get owned because uh, of some unbound, uh, you know, undefined behavior treated differently by compilers on different platforms. <laughs> you, see, Mark, you see, Mark, the problem is that like we are here, we are like applied and uh, applied engineers, right? We are not like hyped driven marketing people. However, I believe that quantum cryptography will be really useful if you want to, you know, build a startup and get a lot of money from investors. So you just say, yeah, we use quantum safe. Yeah, your data is safe with us even when quantum computing is here. So we just underestimate this. This is a huge opportunity. So you're saying that quantum is like the new military grade, like... Uh, <laughs> State Post of quantum the Quantum is yeah. the new military grade, yes. Post quantum yeah. is the new military grade. You heard it here first, folks. This is, uh, this is, we know we're, you know, this is, this is, this is the real talk. This is the real stuff. So this is... Uh, T-shirts this... are coming. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, what you were saying was like, uh, you know, really pertinent. I remember I was reading a paper recently about, uh, from MIT, I think it was, where they reckon that uh, we can get it, uh, we can get Shaw's algorithm down to just 20 million qubits. And of course, we've all got in our sheds back, back there with the liquid helium, you know, like we've all got a... Uh, a 20 million cubic quantum computer so we just we just upload the new uh, the new program and, and go right that's how it goes i think that there's i think that you're both absolutely right there are other problems that need to be at uh, paid attention to first uh, climate change being a particular pet of mine as well I think that's really important but i think that uh, yeah there's a lot of hype and uh, yeah we're gonna it's not gonna go away so we're gonna have to keep sort of fighting and sort of pushing and going look get your tls right first you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. exactly. <laughs> like, make sure, about. yeah, make sure that you have backups. Make sure that those backups are not zero, that you actually can them. put data. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> then, then if you like encrypt backups, make sure that you can decrypt them back because suddenly you can lose the keys. It is not backed up, right? Absolutely, and that and that goes right back to the key management yet again. How do you meet? How do you know? It's, it's just making sure that I think the the thing that people need to maybe do, and what I think hopefully is uh, is coming through, is that cryptography is a perfectly approachable subject, um, and that you know you can learn it. Yes, there's maths involved, but a lot of the maths tends to be justifying something or tends to be explaining something like why is AAS hard to break in this situation or that situation, um, as opposed to you don't need to really understand the mathematics to implemented you know to do the mixed functions to do to generate the arrays and to do the shift rows and all that sort of stuff. Or, or even to understand how it works right to understand how it works it can be like you can get familiar with this mess it doesn't have to be like intuitive for you on like every level it has to be if you try to implement uh, to uh, come up with a new algorithm for sure <laughs> I think exactly right i think it's that's, that's exactly right as a as a statement i think that um I, I want to move on to sort of something a little bit more kind of uh Kind of a fun question which is what is your favorite crypto floor and i'm going to go first um so i've done a lot of code review i used to be a pen tester i'm now a mathematician doing stuff with actually with quantum um long story uh and also with sort of security research but i remember i once did a a, a test where uh, we managed to uh, compromise a, a machine and uh, there was some weird encryption going on and we were like we've not seen this dll before We've never, you know, this was this was like sort of, oh, this could actually be something interesting. Let's have a little look. So we uh, we got it, uh, got the DLL file down. It was in C sharp, so we just got out uh, in .NET, so we could get everything back again. And we were looking through, and we noticed that the encryption function had a typo in it, encryption. Uh, so me and my colleague Matt, we were sort of uh, looking through it, and we just looked at the code, and we were like, huh. So we just copied the function name and searched on Google, and we found a page on Stack Overflow called How to Do AAS in c .net. And um, it turns out that they hadn't just copied the algorithm, they'd also copied the key. Um, like they just copied the whole thing 
and put it in. And so we kind of had a word and said, can you maybe not run this encryption uh, in your production system? And of course, now they don't, and certain questions were asked, and those people aren't allowed to do or weren't allowed to do encryption for a while. I think that was just like sort of, you know, uh, emblematic of so many kind of just, just developer things that like, we just need it to work. How do I do it? And this is why I asked about libraries earlier. I sort of, how do we choose one? And I think you give excellent answers. But that's much my favorite story. Um, I'll let either of you go, uh, go with that. Like, to be honest, when you were saying that, my first thought was that they have this uh, algorithm, like function with typo, but they never use it. It was like my, my, my first like idea. <laughs> yeah, because this, this kind of like approaches I've seen, I've seen, yeah. When people beautiful really like- Beautiful encryption, but like, oh, you never call it, so it doesn't happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You and then you just call base64, and you know, if you can't read, the output it means it's encrypted yeah, right so works, right? yeah obviously <laughs> so well, actually, yeah uh, go ahead no please jen okay i, I was just going to jump in like uh, when we were back to encoding and base64 uh to my surprise if you actually go to wikipedia and um open up the encryption article, it says that encryption is a process of encoding, which I don't know, like, what about other schools, but like in post-Soviet countries, if someone would say that, like, you would go like, oh, no, like, it, encryption requires a secret material, right? It, it requires a key. Encoding works on plain text data without any secret material. So that's the difference. So you cannot say that encryption is encoding, but Wikipedia does say, so Wikipedia is not always right, I guess, what we can learn here. <laughs> and in terms of like popular bugs and or uh, like things you catch in, a, in the implementation, I think for me, the most popular was for sure the misuse of uh, random number generators. And uh, typically people, use the one that's just supposed to be uh, uh, used for like statistical analysis that just produces the necessary distribution, uh, but it's not actually cryptographically secure. Um, because like most of the time that I had to deal with the, the algorithm is secure and the library is secure, but whenever you need to generate the, the random data, that's where it comes to, uh, <laughs> to, to a stop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, regarding encryption and encoding, um... I had, some, I had some thought in mind. Well, anyway, uh, let's get back to crypto flows. I've seen a lot of uh, like this uh, putting password or putting key uh, somewhere near the data, like happens all the time. Uh, putting key right inside uh, to, to the crypto envelope, right? Because we will need to decrypt this data somehow where we will get a key. So let's put the key near the data, obviously. Uh, but I also, but this, this has like quite simple ones, right? Uh, I, re I had really nice, I've seen really nice uh, cryptographic flows with, I know, bits leaking. I, I really like the side channel attacks where some, you know, small bits are leaking on each round and then you can like combine them. Uh, this, this fascinates me, honestly, because this is something that might be really complicated to understand, like to build like a mi mind map, how it works. I also like uh, all these bugs where, you know, some bits or maybe bytes even uh, are extra. And with this extra bytes, you can actually like put something there. So then this is not like a direct bug, but you can use it to build some, you know, like some malware, let's say so. I, I think that I think that in cryptographic computations, because you need to work with, like, with memory mm -hmm. and it's very easy to misuse. Yeah, I mean, my my background is embedded systems. So once uh, Colin O'Flynn released his Chip Whisperer, I was like, this is the best thing ever. Because you just listen very carefully to a microchip and it tells you its secrets. I think it's amazing. And, you know, sort of how do you mitigate that? How do you work around that? What do you have to do to actually sort of uh, uh, stop that from happening? I think that's um, it's a really, really fascinating question. I fully agree. That's a really wonderful part. Looking at random number generators was, Lan, something you mentioned. Um, I remember I was I was doing some stuff about the uh, contact tracing apps, and I noticed that uh, one of the implementations was in uh, Kotlin, and um, I, I, it was that day I was that many days old that I, when I found out that Kotlin doesn't have a secure random number generator of its own yet, um, they simply uh, wrap into the Java secure random number generator. 
So um, yeah, like sort of even in a language as established as Kotlin, you can still have things that are missing. And that's uh, okay. So no, 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 dirty hack is a very nice kind of clean straight pass through. But uh, yeah, there's an interesting pa uh, uh, issue discussion thread about that uh, on the Kotlin uh, GitHub pages. Uh, so that's uh -huh. if. If you could send it, send it to me afterwards, because my team is actually considering Kotlin <laughs> for future use, and <laughs> this I, would be I, a I nice input. Well, send it to you as well. <laughs> <Not a problem. laughs> but you actually can use this API from Java. So they have this interoperability. So if you know what to use, you, you can be fine. Yeah, I think they were they were looking for candidates in the issues so that Kotlin could have its own. Um, but I think uh, some of it uh, ended up going. Why don't we just use the Java one? Like, because then it's you know sort of uh, an, uh, someone else's problem, maybe. I don't know. Uh, I haven't looked at the thread for a while, but I'll dig it out and send it over um, and put it in the chat. It's uh, it's an interesting thing, I to think that you know we're, we're still learning, we're still developing, we're still building, we're still sort of uh, engineering solutions, which is why I admire what uh, both of you do so much. I kind of sit on the fence, breaking things and uh, uh, breaking uh, encryption on microchips, and then people say, "But how do we fix it?" And I'm like, "Ah." But that you might need to speak to a real expert. So I'm, um, so, so I'm, I'm always grateful for, for, for this kind of input. Um, I'm just looking through uh, for yes. Well, yeah, one more interesting bit about this, you know, like modern high-level languages like Kotlin or like Swift, for example, uh, the immutable strings, right? The immutable strings are for the good. But if you work with cryptography and if you have this random idea to take uh, some kind of like cryptographic key and to like to use base 64 encryption for example uh, encoding sorry and you see and put it in a, in a string here is the problem so the strings are kind of immutable so you don't uh, own the process how to wipe out how to delete the content Right, and you can use like perfectly fine cryptographic library. You can write perfectly fine cryptographic code, but you can't control the whole like flow. You can zero the data, you can wipe it out. So you need like your cryptographic code should uh, be uh, written in consideration to the language itself. And maybe you should not use strings in these languages like to put keys or secret data in them. I think that's really important. Do you have any other like sort of set resources for individual languages for like how to do type referencing safely for cryptographic functions? I know there's a lot of activity in the Rust community along those lines. Um, but for other languages like Kotlin or Swift, are there any resources you know of? Uh, well, I know that uh, Jean Philippe has his crypto coding guidelines, and I actually remember them because I, I added some lines about Swift, like exact this is use case about wiping data. But mostly crypto coding guidelines are for C languages, like C language, but there are some, some things that you can find and you can use in your language. Exactly. So um, I'm going to just throw a bit of a curveball because this is an interesting question that has uh, sort of come up. And I think it uh, relates to uh, another question that's sort of going on there about sort of, a sort of formal verification of systems. So I've, I've looked at formal verification and I've looked at sort of the way that these things are going. Do you think it adds to things? Do the, does the, the output of a formal verification step uh, help when you're developing a crypto standard? Uh, and if so, uh, do you have any hints and tips or do you look at it and go, we're not entirely certain? Like, so what, what are your responses to that? Uh, I think, uh basically the formal verification for the protocol is like uh like a um, you know linter for for regular code or static analysis for like regular code it helps you to avoid some uh, already known uh issues uh given that you can properly describe the model uh depends on which kind of formal verification you do right but in some of them you need to first describe the protocol and then you need to actually describe it correctly so th there is like meta thing going on here right is your verification model is correct? Like, how do you verify that your verification model is correct? Uh, so, by all means, it's not I'm a silver bullet. Down, yeah. yeah, yeah. And we had like a story with TLS 1.3, which was formally verified, but uh, uh, there were some omissions in the model, uh, which caused to kind of some minor, uh, uh, minor flaws, I would say, uh, in the protocols that were addressed later. Uh, but as, as with code, as with everything, uh, I would say uh, formal verification is needed and it helps a lot, uh, but it's not silver bullet that's going to solve everything for us, just like static analysis of the code will help to address some bugs, but it's not going to make our code bug free completely. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with Ruslan and I would just add that 
similar to static analysis with the code, you need someone to keep an eye on that, right? So similarly with uh, formal verification, you need like uh, experts and now like people who know how to do this, like to, to, to rule the process, to get back and to, you know, to keep an eye. Otherwise it's, it's just a tool. If you use it correctly, uh, you will have some results like helpful for you. If you misuse it, or like if you don't build the model good enough, like sorry, you tried. And the best thing here is like illusion of security, right? Because you tried, you put a lot of effort and you like you believe that you do everything, you did everything right. So you kind of unknown, unknown. You don't know what what was wrong. Yeah, and so you can so, uh... I think what you both said is really, uh, really, really important about formal verification. That as long as you are complete with your verification, then you'll get out. But if you put, if you miss something in, then you're going to get. And if, if your input is incomplete, then your output is also going to have a level of incompleteness. And I think it's very important to remember that you can't ever be 100% sure that your formal verification means everything is safe and it's only butterflies and bunny rabbits and birds and uh, beautiful fields. No, no, you have to, you have to be careful and always double check, always recheck. Um, and get others to check what you're doing and sort of have, have a look at what's going on and just make sure and then wait for that moment, usually either at 4 a.m. because you can't sleep or when you're sort of standing there in the shower with you know, you're doing your hair and then suddenly you get an idea. It's why I've, why I find a friend of mine keeps a whiteboard marker in his bathroom um, because he, he makes notes while he's having a shower. Um, I, he's the only friend I know who does that. And no, the friend isn't me. Uh, so just just so we're all just so we're all there. Uh, of course, of course. Yes, you believe me, right? Sure. You can verify that. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I have one question that's kind of unusual, and this has come up. Um, this is from a friend of mine, uh, David Albon, um, who kind of said he's reading this stuff about formal about uh, fully homomorphic encryption, um, and he's like sort of. So I'm reading about this, and I'm like. Are there any like real practical uses? He seems to think of this as a kind of a beautiful mathematical exercise that is good for mathematicians grants, not necessarily for our engineering budgets. So what do you guys, uh, do you guys see a, a future where fully homomorphic encryption saves the day in a Hollywood film? I would say it probably would not save the day, uh, to be honest. Uh, there are some very interesting properties that homomorphic encryption uh, allows right but there is inherent problem with it by design that is malleable meaning that you can uh, it's very hard to authenticate the data uh, even though i've seen there are already some some schemes that kind of try to combine with other techniques to allow to do that uh, but basically the idea is that uh, it's like textbook RSA where you can modify the ciphertext and it will get encrypted uh, decrypted to a valid uh, input but to a different one and uh, initially, it doesn't seem like a big deal, but in many scenarios, it can cause a, a lot of trouble. Uh, and with homomorphic encryption, it's very hard to, to avoid that property. Um, so it's hard to say for sure. Uh, maybe in the future, we'll discover some, uh, some scheme that um, completely solves that problem for us. Uh, like, for example, I know that some research driven by the quantum hype, uh, right, some research in quantum algorithms actually produce algorithms that are that also have interesting properties from point of view of homomorphic encryption. So maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have some process progress there. Uh, but until now, uh, aside from that, homomorphic encryption is very slow. So it's no, nowhere near with uh, uh, efficiency of uh, like classical encryption algorithms. So it might have a very good uh, use case in some you know niche narrow use cases like scenarios um to solve some problems but i don't think that it's going to be like a silver bullet that once we'll switch every, everything to it and we will forget about uh, data leaks uh that's i don't think that's going to happen and you want to yeah. ask a great a great use for it yet Unfortunately, like we are probably the you know bad people to holy war about you know topics because Most like, boring cryptography. Yeah, yeah. like <laughs> you know <laughs> the idea the idea is nice, but it has some implications during implementation. So yeah, like depends, right? Uh, from my experience, a lot of people ask like as a, as a company. Uh, about homomorphic encryption when they ask about searchable encryption. So, you know, this idea when your data is encrypted, but you can still search in this encrypted data. And sometimes we are talking about really simple search, like exact queries, and sometimes 
uh, like people want to have this magical search, like full text search on encrypted data. And how morphic encryption uh, is being like mentioned in these discussions as something that could potentially save, like uh, uh, answer these questions, right? Uh, but as a, as a company, like, and myself, I totally agree with Ruslan, homomorphic encryption is a good idea. It has some, like fully homomorphic encryption has some niche, um, it can work some, in some narrow cases and niche cases, but for most industry, you know, like uh, industrial applications, especially when you want to have like encryption of data, which means that you will have a lot of things going on, right? It might be too, I know, too slow, and it might be like as you need to have like a totally you know separate like uh, cryptographic management infrastructure to support this so too slow and um, too much things to think of if you want to maintain uh, the solution i think those are really good uh, good takes on it and one thing i will say is that sort of fully homomorphic encryption i think the best example is based on lattices right so um, what the question I think we need to sort of start looking to, to round off our session, and I think I'm going to pose this question to you. So NIST, as we mentioned at the start, they are selecting, and uh, they're selecting post-quantum, and they're selecting all these very cool things. So where do, uh, where do you guys think that uh, things are going to actually go? Uh, do you think that it's going to be like a lattice-based crypto, or is it going to be team super singular isogenies and elliptic curves? Uh, it's, it's hard to say because, uh... Uh, basically, that mass evolved a little bit after my time at the, at the academia, right? So I'm not very up to date with, we, we did have some lattices because NGRU already was a scene back then. Uh, but uh, since like with super Sajanese and stuff, uh, we did not have much, much of deep dive into those. Uh, so it's hard for me to give like a, um, an informed opinion on this particular mess, right? It's going back and forward. Like if you keep an eye on, on discussions and stuff, it's like people do have their opinions, right? Someone says one is the best thing and it probably has to do with who developed what, what kind of scheme for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think, uh, you know, it's good to have a uh, general like progress uh, in, the, in the research field. Um, there are, basically we're just discovering some new scenes right and as you mentioned right lattices for example do provide some uh, interesting properties like for homomorphic encryptions and even uh, back, back, back to homomorphic encryption itself uh, while it's not going to be i don't think it's going to be a big thing in its own but maybe at some point it's going to be stitched with a number of other techniques or, or algorithms that will provide some new very interesting values like with digital currencies and bitcoin there was no new cryptography uh, developed back then at least now there is a lot of research in the field as well but basically it was hashing encryption and signature nothing new but it was combined together in interesting ways that would provide some interesting new properties uh, and i think uh, it doesn't really matter which which kind of uh, algorithms we, we, we'll stick with uh, you know we might go with isogenies but then lattices will do a strike back after a while for some other use cases like homomorphic encryption so, do, so, which one, so which one do you think will win, though? We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. And Anastasia, do you have a better? Do you have a better? Because I, this is one of those cases where I'm like, it's it's a fifty fifty chance. Well, uh, for me, I'm even in 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 a worse like position because I don't have this you know formal cryptography education. So I'm like completely an observer of the whole like discussion and like okay so this is interesting oh no this idea is also like makes a lot of sense and i stopped you know making like here my my own choice i like okay i may be you know not qualified to talk about these things i will just you know take a step back and look what's going on because like sorry people are already discussing they have their arguments let them like show and uh but i i think that we might have maybe something new, um, like the new approaches, because I really like this uh, Ruslan thought that maybe like uh, some approaches will emerge and we will have some new things based on all things so it's like qualities of new. So yeah, I would say that this might be the solution. So I would also, oh, sorry. Uh, I just wanted to add quickly that I would, wouldn't also call, you know, whoever, uh, 
gets picked by Nest, I wouldn't call that like a, a total win yet. Because first, there is certain level of distrust in Nest right now after like 2012 or which year was it? Um, so it's just one body, and we also have ISO. We also have just the community, uh, like Bernstein ciphers, kind of. Uh, jumped in, you know, without any formal standardization first and got popular and were standardized after the fact, specifically because of this like level of distrust. So uh, we'll see. It's an interesting ride. That's a really, really good point to make, actually. So I'm, I am a, I'm a mathematician by background. So I've read sort of some of the background papers, and um, I am going to put my stake uh, in uh, in the ground. Um, Go for it. To give this some kind of round out. So, um, uh, but I'm, I'm going to give like sort of a, a, a two leveled answer. So I'm going to say that super singular isogenies, uh, for those who don't know, basically guarantees that the background group on your elliptic curve stuff is is really big. So you've got generated sets of, of, of at least four. So it's like, it's, it's really nice kind of mathematics. And I personally think that the super singular isogenies is the more beautiful of the mathematics. Um, and I can already feel, oh, I felt, I could feel the disagreement. But uh, but I think that, I think Lattice, because of uh, properties to do with the fact that it lends itself towards homomorphic encryption with, uh, with, with given examples. And I think that uh, because uh, of the way that uh, it's being implemented, I think Lattice has got the edge in terms of the engineering advantages. Uh, I think they're both beautiful systems. Uh, one is slightly better mathematically, but I think that Lattice is going to... Uh, possibly win out a little bit, or certainly it, it, it might win a few hearts, even if it doesn't win uh, a, a few races. But um, only time will tell, I think. Only time will tell. And I don't know. I, if I'm right, I'll, uh, I'll capitalize uh, on Twitter later in about a year's time. But if I'm, I'm, I'm probably wrong. So uh, don't place any bets based on what uh, a crazy long-haired mathematician in London says. <laughs> Nice, yeah. Whatever, uh, whatever gets standardized. I think the the winner is the one who's actually gonna get widely used if we ever get to that point. Yeah, yeah. And we'll we'll see how that uh, how that bridge goes when we actually uh, come across it. I think that that's been an absolutely stellar um, uh, discussion. Um, I'm gonna start drawing to a close and just sort of say that uh, from my point of view, I am greatly indebted to you both. Thank you so much for agreeing to do it. Um, it's been and absolutely, I've, I've enjoyed it. I hope you both have too. I hope people watching have also had a nice insight that, you know, cryptographers are wonderful people. It's always been my experience and uh, crypto engineers are a sort of actually cool people to have around and to, and to party with. Well, maybe not at the moment. We'll have to wait for lockdown. Uh, maybe 2030, <laughs> 2040. I don't know when it's going to end. But uh, one day I'm sure we'll... Uh, We'll have conversations uh, in real life again but thank you both so so much also thank you to uh to matt for putting this on i'll keep an idea an eye on any extra questions but i'm uh i don't see any have matt have you got any questions for us yeah if, uh, f thanks for the the round table actually i also enjoyed it uh <laughs> it, it was quite entertaining uh yeah, no, like uh, no, not uh, no, no question. Just some uh, some comments uh, to the point uh, Ruslan was saying about startups. It's true, like uh, most of startups don't really have uh, like security is not really uh, pretty high on the priority, and they can just put in. Uh, we, we see it often, like they just say like oh it's secure uh, by default in their press release, and that's pretty much it. I mean uh, we, we we have seen it with Zoom. Uh, they kind of waited a long, long time, uh, but they're definitely not an exception. And they were quite big. They were like post IPO when they started to focus on security. Uh, and uh, all the talk about like end to end encryption was also like uh, quite interesting. I'm pretty sure we're going to hear about uh, people uh, diverging opinions on end to end encryption for a while. And uh, it, it does remind me once I was having a discussion with. Uh, of someone about uh, about end to end encryption, I was like saying, well, end to end encryption is uh, it's it, it's it's quite good. It's like, no, no, it's broken. I'm like, what do you mean it's broken? Wh which one is broken? It's like, no, no, it's, uh, I've read it on the internet. It's broken. I'm like, okay, send send me the link. And it's like, no, it's broken. Uh, but there is a better algorithm. It's like, oh, really? T tell me. It's like the OEE algorithm. I was like, what's that? And I googled it. It's like the one end encryption of, uh, by Vioc. <laughs> it was like a pure trolley. It was like this like uh, GitHub repository thing. It's, this is uh, actually that it's, it's pretty funny. Let me, let me just. Uh, is that also GP's creation? One end algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like 
this is uh, <laughs> secure against hostile endpoints. OEE is post quantum, quantum safe, quantum resilient. <laughs> OEE is secure even if P equal NP. <laughs> OEE is post nodal <laughs> NSA proof. Uh, OEE is gluten free and non GMO. It's like <laughs> OEE is probably secure. I was like, oh, it's definitely a troll. And then I was like, did you read all of it? It's like, yeah, 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 I read it. It looks really good. I was like, oh man, like uh, if even people who know like about uh, software and uh, development don't even understand what's a troll from uh, not a troll, you know, like uh, it, it's becoming dangerous. So imagine when, uh, you know, like when there's something like Zoom happening and people are like, well, is it really secure? You know, like then you're like, well, <laughs> it depends. What do you mean? You know, like they're like, oh, should we use uh, uh, like this other app instead? You're like, well. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, because like in the, th the interesting thing that happened with end-to-end -end encryption is uh, it's actually becoming a mainstream discussion, you know, because, t uh, you know, like, although like TLS, like because of HTTPS and everything, you could say like it's becoming more mainstream, but like end-to-end -end encryption is uh, in the news a lot. Like, um, mm. I don't know if you guys have seen like the uh, anchor chat, like uh, shutdown that happened. Uh, was it in France and Netherlands? Uh, that that was uh, pretty interesting to follow. Um, I mean, it's it's kind of cool to see like there's more and more people talking about like crypto and like uh, security and all those things that you know it's just not a very like small pocket of people like being actually interested by it. I think my um, to talk about end-to-end -end encryption. One of my favorite stories is someone once uh, I overheard a conversation where they said, "Oh, end-to-end -end encryption? What's that?" I just said, "Oh, you just encrypt it." Oh yeah, yeah, end to end, and, <laughs> and that was his, his complete explanation of end to end encryption. So yeah, I think there's there's a lot of education that needs to go on, and there's a lot of discussion around things. And I think that um, hopefully uh, AMAs like this and the ability to go look, we'll answer questions, we'll see how things go, and yeah, uh, that's important. And thank you very much for the platform, Matt. It's been uh, it's been fun. Uh, well, thanks to uh, all of you for joining, and uh, thanks to you, Mark, for like uh, moderating and uh, driving the discussion. It was uh, v very interesting. Uh, maybe the the next one, uh, both of us will go to uh, to Ukraine, so we can do it uh, physically with Anastasia and uh, Ruslan. <laughs> I, I think that's the obvious conclusion. <laughs> I'll have to go to Ukraine too, though, because right now I'm in California. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, yeah, so I, I, we can actually we can meet in London, you know, like in the middle of the world. Neutral, neutral territory, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I was kind of looking top. forward the pierogi and the okroshka, like in London, you know, like the beers. <laughs> <laughs> and borscht, of course. Uh, yeah, <laughs> my pleasure, and thanks a lot for inviting us as well. It's been a great, great discussion. Yeah, and right. I really enjoy the questions from the audience, like in the chat. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, not, uh, you, you, guys, uh, you, you all were, were great. Uh, it was very cool. Well, thanks again uh, for, for joining. And uh, yeah, I guess uh, talk to you soon. Take care. <laughs> Take care. And we are getting to uh, the end of... Uh, today's uh, episode which is like I said the, the last episode uh, quick quick uh, reminder so the discord server is still gonna be uh, available let me see if I can just put it here um, yeah so the discord server is still gonna be uh, available so do not hesitate to, to join it um, Actually, there, there are people like uh, watching on, on, on Twitch. Uh, that, that's cool. Uh, yeah, definitely subscribe on Twitch. Uh, if I do uh, some live stream, I think it's just going to be like uh, ad hoc and definitely uh, on Twitch because it's, it's easier. Uh, and some of the uh, discussion also uh, are also on, uh, on Spotify, on the, on the podcast. Um, because like... Uh, uh, the, the previous group was just saying there's definitely a lot of uh, educational work to be done. Uh, so, I mean, I think Spotify is uh, also good, uh, a good platform for that. Um, so, obviously, the moment uh, all the people left and who are watching now uh, or waiting to know is probably like 
with uh, the, the the winner for the complimentary uh, t uh, black hat ticket um well so that was uh <laughs> timo kroshka <laughs> that's very that's pretty funny um yeah uh, so well that that was pretty easy easy uh easy uh to uh, to choose uh, at least to collect uh, the data uh because only like three people tweeted uh with the hashtag and uh you know, based on the rules so uh, just have to pick uh, between the, the, the three people for the complimentary ticket. Um, yeah, so congratulations to you. And I hope you're watching now. So that's uh, Ramblina. Um, Ramblina, yeah. So you uh, won for the uh, complimentary ticket for, for Black Hat. So I will send you uh, a Porsche for sure. I, I will send you uh, the, the information in uh, in DM uh, on uh, on Twitter uh, for the complimentary ticket. So uh, congratulations uh, again to you. And uh, yeah, if uh, for yeah, if you have any question or suggestion, you know, like if you. Uh, you know, I have suggestion for like a new format. Uh, definitely, like uh, s send me a word. Uh, I, I'm open to uh, to listen to it. So, like I was saying, uh, I, you know, like I was like uh, thinking. I had the goal when I started the live stream is to be like, okay, I'm gonna give like uh, 10, uh, 10 virtual conference every two weeks, and I'm gonna stick to it. Um, just so like uh, you know, uh, to not bail uh, in in between. So that's what uh, has been done. All the material uh, from the previous edition is available on YouTube um, in uh, the integrity for free. Uh, so that's also, uh, I think, uh, I think it's pretty cool. Uh, there's definitely a lot of material now to learn. And yeah, like I was saying also the Discord, which is right above uh, my head now. Uh, come join the server and do not hesitate to ask questions if you want to learn more about uh, security or software development and other things uh, and uh, yeah I guess that's that's uh, pretty much it uh, yeah uh, what, uh, let me check the chat um, but yeah <laughs> congratulations on a really good, a really good series 10 out of 10 well uh, th thanks Mark <laughs> I'm sure your favorite was the last one, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, because yeah, I, I do think like streaming is pretty cool. There's definitely a lot of uh, you know like potential for like uh, a lot of like uh, cool material, uh, but yeah, definitely need to get some ideas uh, about like uh, you know some potential formats and stuff, you know, because. Uh, you know, as long as it's educative and interesting, uh, I think it's definitely uh, definitely worth it. Um, I mean, even myself, you know, I, I enjoy like presenting like uh, no, like two weeks ago uh, when I was giving uh, myself a presentation uh, here about the uh, the uh, ARM64 like Windows Exploit I wrote. You know, uh, I, I found it like more practical than actually going to to conference. Although, like you know, I, I guess. Uh, at some point, we we all gonna go back to like physical conferences, uh, but like Mark was saying, you know, we don't know when it's gonna happen. Uh, it seems like you know, there's a second wave now. Uh, <laughs> should have gone for zero uh, out of ten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Laura, for watching uh, and being a, a good uh, supporter since uh, the first uh, episode um and uh but yeah like I, I i don't think it's kind of cool you know that you can actually like speak to some people and you know like uh, kind of share it uh, like i was saying you know like at the point no even like with twitter is still nice but it's getting like very uh, very noisy so it's kind of hard to like filter out um so oh no enjoy them <laughs> whether well, it should have gone for zero out of ten if you enjoyed them on then uh, jason what do you mean <laughs> uh, but yeah, 
that's uh yeah that, that's pretty much it so i don't know like do you have any uh, any questions or comments for this uh last edition um you know any 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 uh any any feedback uh trying to see if uh uh I should probably message uh, that person who just uh, won uh, now. You know, like uh, it's probably wondering why. Actually, did he comment it? Uh, when, no, is it <laughs> when are you doing it again? Uh, well, there's no, I mean, I'm saying like uh yeah there is no no other like a uh, new session so I won't do uh any uh again maybe I'll do like some ad hoc like chat you know just like uh, a, a single format some random dates as well like definitely subscribe on on the Twitch because I think I'm just going to stream on Twitch uh anyway after um like the main reason I was like streaming uh, on YouTube initially is because I knew like everyone has a uh, YouTube account on Twitch like the there were not as many people uh, using it, uh, but definitely not sure when uh, I will stream again. Uh, but for Upcode 2020, uh, for the virtual summit, that's uh, definitely that's uh, the 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 last episode. So for the video uh, from today, so there's like the full integrity of the live stream, which is already available now, and. The slides from the first presentation are uh, available on uh, on GitHub. Uh, well, will be available on GitHub because I still have to upload them. And if you want the slides from like the previous uh, uh, conference, uh, you can just get them here. So if you go to Upcode GitHub, all the slides are here. So you can find all the uh, content uh, here. So you go to 2020, uh, July is like all the dates. So I will add it uh, tomorrow for the first uh, presentation. And there's like all the other like uh, edition um, and also like previous years or so. Um, but yeah, so that's basically how the content uh, is organized. Uh, it, it, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. <laughs> but yeah. Cool. Well, if there is no more questions, I guess, I guess that's uh, that's it. I will uh, say uh, bye to uh, to all of you and uh, have a great uh, a great summer, wh whatever uh, you're you're all doing. Um. So yeah. Bye and uh, enjoy the rest of uh, well of July, soon uh, to be August. Mm -hmm.